All right. Um, yeah, so I want to thank uh, Shui Miao and the other organizers for inviting me. Um, I guess I should be able to share my screen somehow, or maybe I don't have the... Yes, yes, one second. Permission. Good. Good. Okay. Let me spotlight you. Um, ah, okay. Uh, so actually, I'm still not seeing the option to share screen. Am I? You, I think, are allowed to share screen. Huh. Um, that's strange. Yeah, I, I don't have the normal option here. Maybe I can also try. Oh, oh wait, let's try, let's try this. Here, sorry about that. Uh, there we go. All right. Okay, so can you all see this? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry for the slow start there. Um, okay, yeah, so once again, thanks uh, for the organizers for the invitation to talk. Um, I actually have uh, just gotten my first uh, COVID vaccine, so I have, I'm very hopeful for uh, maybe someday being able to come to Maryland in person. But um, and for the time being, I'm, I'm excited to give this talk today. Um, okay, right, so I, I'll be talking about Kilarichi solitons and toric geometry, so I'll start with some introductory um, um, things here. Just to, just to check, can you guys see my cursor when I move? Oh. Yes. Okay, good. Um, just so as I highlight things. Um, so we'll start uh, with a complex manifold uh, and the complex dimension will be N. Um, so this J uh, is well, the no standard notation I'll be using. It's an endomorphism of the tangent bundle which squares to the negative the identity. Um, and we'll say that uh, Ramani metric is Kähler if this J is an orthogonal transformation with respect to this metric, and if the this metric makes this complex structure that was given uh, parallel. Um, um, so you know the one of the standard things you will do in Kähler geometry is uh, instead of really worrying about um, the Ramanian metric so much, you get all the information you need from a corresponding symplectic form called the Kähler form, which you get in this way, um, and you can. Uh, if you introduce some complex coordinates, then you can see that the uh, this gij bar here is a Hermitian positive definite matrix that encodes everything you need to know about the metric as well. So that's the setting we'll be working in. Um, so a Kähler-Ricci soliton uh, is a pair of, of, of things. It's some information, uh, this Kähler form and a uh, holomorphic vector field. Um, we asked that to satisfy an equation. Um, so here I have the Ricci form and uh, the term with involving the lead derivative, and then this is a multiple just of the metric itself. Um, and so if you are familiar with these things, if you've seen um, uh, these things before, oh, what happened here? Sorry, technical difficulties just don't seem to stop here. Um, is it something? Oh, yeah, can sorry, can you can you see again now? Uh, we were always seeing you. We 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 were seeing you. Okay, that's that's sorry. Something something might have just gone strong more wrong on my end. So you you can see this now and everything's back to normal. Okay, apologies again. Um, yeah, so just if you've seen these things before, there's a lot of different conventions about the signs and the coefficients in front of all three of these terms. Um, so just for simplicity in my setting, this is the, the most convenient way to express this. Um, so uh, in particular, you might see a negative sign uh, on this term. Um, and that's it's the same thing, just switch the sign of the vector field. Um, the metric is called Kähler-Einstein if, no, if there's no vector field term here, right? It's something, it's an old standing, thing to study. Um, 
and we can rescale things so we can like just as in the killer Einstein setting if you're familiar with that just to make sure that this lambda is plus one zero minus one um, when it's positive we'll say that this is a shrinking soliton uh, when it's zero we'll say steady and expanding uh, in the negative case um, and this has some correlation because the Ricci form represents the first turn class of your manifold uh, this has some condition on uh, what the cohomology class of this um, closed two form can possibly be. So in the shrinking case, it's going to be inside the first turn class. Okay, so we say that um, it's a gradient if this holomorphic vector field, which is part of our original data, is the gradient of a smooth function um, with respect to our, our given metric. Remember, right? So this G is the, if given a soliton, this G is the soliton metric, I say that this the vector field happens to also be the gradient with respect to G of, of some function. Um, <clears throat> well, when you work things out, it turns out that this lead derivative term becomes exceptionally simple in the Kähler case. And I get a simplification of the equation that looks like this. So I just have an I delta bar of this, uh, this function F, which we're going to call the soliton potential. Um, if you hear me say that, that's always referring to this function F. Um, and so there's a lot of adjectives, shrinking gradient, Kähler Ricci soliton. Um, these things are, are, I think, of interest originally um, because they are models of what can happen uh, along the Ricci flow when you reach a singularity where the curvature is not uh, getting too large as you approach the singular time. So it's kind of a, the nicer singularities of the Ricci flow are in some sense modeled off of what um, these uh, these metrics, at least, you know, usually on a non-compact manifold. Um, but for reasons which are not really so much that, for the rest of the time, we'll be, we'll be mostly considering these. Um, so shrinking and gradient, Kähler-Ricci solitons. Um, so just some examples pretty fast here. Um, so on CN, you take the standard Euclidean metric, whose symplectic form looks like this. Um, if I just take my vector field to be the Euler vector field here, um, well, obviously the Ricci curvature of this metric is zero. Um, and the, if I look at this lead derivative term, it's a fast computation to check that this is equal to um, the original metric itself. So this actually just says that the metric is a cone, if you're familiar with that. Um, so this is a, a shrinking gradient killer Ricci soliton um, with, this, with respect to this vector field. Um, it's called the Gaussian shrinking soliton. Um, the reason that this gradient is, I mean, you can see if you like that this, uh, if I let this function just be the norms of the, or the, the radius squared, um, then the gradient with respect to the Euclidean metric is just the Euler vector field. And so it's Gaussian has something to do with the, um, there's an associated me measure space, which I won't talk about really. Um, Okay, so another key example that we'll, you know, we'll need to see again is the Fubini study metric on CPN. Um, you know, you choose an the, the appropriate normalization in front of this thing so that it uh, lies in the first turn class. Um, so it's, this is actually a Kähler Einstein metric. So like I mentioned before, this is just a Kähler Ricci soliton with, uh, with no vector field. Um, any such thing is clearly gradient. Um, you just take the zero function. Um, so that's another key example we'll run into again. Um, some less trivial examples. Um, there's these classic ones, uh, Feldman, Nilman, and Knopf in 2003. They looked at negative line bundles over CPN minus one and used the uh, natural UN action and sort of reduced that problem to solving a, an ODE. Found some uh, shrinking gradient killer Ricci solitons for on the total space of this line bundle, these line bundles. Um, and more, much more recently, as a generalization of that, um, we have examples of Futaki. Um, so if I replace CPN minus one by some sort of any uh, suitably nice uh, compact uh, Kähler manifold, um, and I replace this ohm negative K by uh, any negative line bundle um, with this, again, sufficiently nice here, um, so these are going to be roots of the canonical bundle over Tor quantum manifolds, and we'll encounter what that means a bit more later on. There are also uh, shrinking gradient Kähler-Ricci solitons on these spaces as well. 
Um, okay, so what I've been concerned with is the question of uniqueness. So just a few words on like the history of studying this problem. Um, so for the moment, we'll, we'll focus on compact manifolds. Um, that's the historical uh, starting point here. Um, and the original question is about Keller-Einstein metrics. This is due to Calabi in the 50s. Um, he showed that these are, you know, if one of these exists, at least, then it's unique, assuming that this uh, uh, lambda is zero or negative one. So that would be um, uh, zero first turn class or negative case. Um, lambda being positive is a, is a sort of substantially more difficult problem. And one of the key reasons is that um, you'll have holomorphic automorphisms um, in that case and you, and you and you won't in the others. So the, the issue is that if I have a, 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 you know, a diffeomorphism that happens to also pull back the complex structure to itself, then this uh, pullback metric will still be Kähler-Einstein. Um, and that's gonna be a similar problem in the uh, uh, soliton case. Um, but it is unique up to this action of the automorphisms that's proved by Bando and Mabuchi in the 80s, so far later. Um, so even later, um, so talking about Kehlerich, more general Kehlerichi solitons. Um, so actually the, the uh, zero and negative constant case uh, turns out to be simpler. Uh, there's kind of a, a, a quick trick you can do to show that in fact, the vector field has to vanish if you're going to have on a compact manifold a shrinking or a steady uh, Kehlerichi soliton. Um, so that kind of, um, you, know, you, you rule it out immediately, you, it reduces to the Kehler-Einstein case. For lambda equals one, this is uh, known now, um, proved by Tian and Zhu in the early 2000s. Again, this type of result of Bendo Mabuchi unique up to that action of automorphisms. Um, okay, so I'll be mostly interested in the non-compact case because the, the compact case is solved. Um, um, and in general, non-compact uh, manifolds, it's very hard or, it's a subtle issue, uh, the issue of uniqueness. And it's because of maybe the obvious reason that there's a lot of possibilities of what can happen as you go off to infinity. Um, so some results that I wanna highlight that are um, uh, things that are something you can obtain uh, that your techniques could be maybe more similar to the compact case. Um, these results of Kokshwar and Wong uh, show that um, on some special manifolds, if you look at metrics, which are already asymptotic to some fixed nice metric, um, then there's only one such uh, shrinking gradient Ricci soliton, um, which is asymptotic to that fixed thing that you start with. Um, so if you're interested in some cone metrics or a cylinder, um, you can get some results like this in there. And there are more results, um, more people I probably should mention um, that I don't know about. Um, the result that I want to highlight as uh, something that, you know, I guess I would like to aspire to is uh, this recent result of Conlon, Derwill, and Sun, which says that if I have a complete shrinking gradient, Kalo Ricci soliton, and if I just assume that the Ricci curvature is bounded, and I'm interested in a few key uh, uh, underlying manifolds, so the Euclidean space, um, or the total space of these line bundles that were considered by Feldman, Ilmanen, and Knopf, um, then you also have uniqueness up to uh, automorphisms essentially. So here this says, um, if the manifold is CN, then this uh, soliton has to be the one that I mentioned earlier, the Euclidean case, the Gaussian shrinking soliton. And if your underlying manifold is the total space of these negative line bundles, then again, up to automorphism, um, this, your thing is isometric say to um, those ones I mentioned earlier, constructed by Feldman, Ilman, and Knopf. So this doesn't mention much about the behavior of the metric at infinity, just maybe bounded Ricci curvature. So that's a bit more flexible than saying it's already asymptotic to those, um, has to be equal to them. This is just saying uh, pure uniqueness as long as the Ricci curvature is bounded. And there's some good indications that that, act, that Ricci bounded hypothesis um, could be removed. Um, so to state my results, I want to, I need to introduce a bit more. Um, so uh, to m the setting I'm working in is, uh, is that of toric manifolds, and it's the title of the talk at least advertises that. Um, so again, we're gonna be uh, considering a complex manifold of complex dimension N. 
Um, and we're going to suppose it emits an action of the complex torus, which is just C star to the n. Right, so notice that this n here is the same as the complex dimension. Um, and you know, with some nice properties. So first of all, it's, it has to be an effective action. So that means that there's nothing in C star to the n that does nothing. Um, so if there's a, uh, every element of C star to the n moves at least one point. Um, it's holomorphic. That's probably a natural assumption. Um, and I'm going to also put a sl slightly more technical assumption that the fixed point set consists of finitely many points. Um, of course, if the manifold is compact, that's going to come for free. Um, that's the data that I'm going to call a toric manifold. So this, this complex manifold together with this action. Um, and it turns out that in this setting, there's always going to be at least one point. And of course, once there's one point, there'll be many, such that if I look at the orbit of C star to the N of this point, um, it is uh, open and dense inside of the, the manifold I'm considering. So you can, can, you can view your manifold as just C star to the N with some extra things thrown in at infinity. Um, and again, if it's compact, you completely compactify as a partial compactification because you might throw something in on some spaces and then have, uh, it may still extend off to infinity in other directions. Um, so an important feature of this is that there is the inclusion of the real torus, maybe obviously, um, inside of C star to the n, which just looks like the unit circle on each of the C star factors. Um, and so that gives rise to an action of this real torus, and we're going to be interested in Kähler metrics on these manifolds, which are which have this torus as their symmetry or inside of their symmetry group. Okay, so here's some silly pictures I drew, um, just to, to get a to get a sense of what these things look like. Um, all right, so on C, you have a C star to the a C star action, just given by multiplication, right? Um, and on CP1, you have essentially just the uh, stereographic, inverse stereographic projection of the one I drew, C star action, um, which, you know, in the right uh, homogeneous coordinates looks the same as this. So I think that's fairly straightforward. I just wanted an excuse to draw some pictures. Um, so just to note that the uh, Euclidean metric is preserved under the S1 action here, and the Fubini study metric is preserved, of course, under rotations along an axis. So, you know, a few, a few less trivial examples, but still fairly trivial, I guess. Um, C, C to the n, I can, I can look at the same action that I just drew, just in more dimensions, so just given by multiplication. Um, and on CPN, I do exactly the same thing, right? So I just take that action on CN and I look at the, I add a CP n minus one at infinity. Um, so just a quick thing to note back on this slide here, you'll notice that I have a copy of C without the origin inside of C. And if I delete these two points I drew in purple here, I have that, that's my copy of C star inside of CP1. So that's this compactification picture. Um, so if I'm also looking at the total space of O minus K, um, this is also toric, so I just explained to you why CPN minus one is toric. Well, then I also have this line bundle, but the fibers of a line bundle come with the natural C star uh, action. You just multiply those fibers, right? Um, the same way you did on C. Um, and so that will, turns out, is, is nice enough to, to qualify with my uh, extra conditions I gave. So, gives us the structure of a toric manifold. And indeed, the um, FIK examples are invariant under this real corresponding real torus action. Um, it, this, uh, I told you these were UN invariant, and it turns out that this real torus sits as the natural sort of diagonal subspace inside of UN. It's a sort of standard maximal torus in UN. Uh, even better, um, you can do the same sort of thing on any, uh, on a negative line bundle over a toric manifold um, by just taking the C star action, which rotates the fibers. And Futaki's recent examples of uh, shrinking gradient Kilrichi solitons are on spaces like this. So they're over a toric manifold um, and they do turn out to be invariant under this natural uh, real torus action. Um, so if you're familiar with any of this, they're uh, constructed by this Kalabi ansatz, um, which is a general way of producing some kind of metrics on line bundles and total spaces of line bundles. Um, there's tons more examples of torque manifolds coming from algebraic geometry that I won't have much time to get into uh, how to get those. 
Um, okay, so now what is the, my main result says that up to automorphisms, uh, there's at most one complete TN invariant shrinking gradient killer Ricci soliton on a toric manifold. So if I start with a toric manifold and I have a killer Ricci soliton, um, there's only one TN invariant one. Um, so a few notes about this. So first of all, um, again, I'm, I'm not making any actually assumptions on what the behavior at infinity is at all, um, which I think is kind of cool. It turns out to just work without, without anything there. So I don't say anything about bounded curvature even. Uh, I definitely am not requiring its asymptotics be prescribed. Um, but this TN invariant hypothesis is fairly strong. So I replace that with extra symmetry. Um, another thing is that completeness is really key there. Um, if you're familiar with any of these things, you probably will have thought of a thousand counterexamples already if I don't have the word complete here. Um, so for example, if I just look at uh, the, any inclusion of CN inside of CPN and I restrict the Fubini Studi metric, uh, that'll give me something which is not the Euclidean metric and is also a shrinking gradient killer Ricci soliton on CN, it's just not complete. And to generalize that example, there's this classic result of Wang Zhu, which says that on any compact toric Fano manifold, there's a shrinking gradient killer Ricci soliton. So I can just take the complement of any torus invariant sub variety inside of this, and restrict that thing um, on my, yeah. so that's some non-compact thing. Uh, and I'll have, you know, potentially many different metrics that I could obtain this way. Then none of them will be complete. Okay, um, but so sort of that's just a note about completeness. We'll come back to that in a bit. Um, but another note here is that you know a lot of the time this TGN invariance is not an ideal assumption. So maybe we could replace this with some more natural geometric condition. Um, so again. Um, same setting here, we're going to start off with a complex manifold, uh, positively non-compact, and just I'm always going to highlight the complex dimension is n, um, so real dimension 2n. So now we'll work in a slightly different setting. So now I won't assume that it has an action of this full big um, algebraic or complex torus, um, but just some uh, an action which is still effective and holomorphic, but of the real torus um, tn, so some product of s1s. And again, this n here is going to match the complex dimension, which is sort of the maximal dimension you can have of an action like this. Um, so uh, if you differentiate this action, um, then you'll get the, the Lie algebra of this torus inside of the space of holomorphic vector fields on your manifold, right? So this action itself is holomorphic, so that when you differentiate, that'll mean the vector field that you get is holomorphic. Um, Okay, so that's just uh, to understand the statement here. Um, so the the another version of this uh, of this uniqueness um, I approve says uh, that up to automorphisms, if I start with a uh, non-compact toric manifold, um, but maybe I shouldn't say toric. I should say supposing that I'm in this setting. So M J admits the section of this real torus, um, and I have a shrinking gradient complete Kähler Ricci soliton here. And the, and the Ricci curvature is bounded. Um, and I assume, again, that uh, the, the vector field is in this Lie algebra. So I, I put some assumption on the vector field here, and I put some assumption on the Ricci curvature. But the Ricci curvature assumption is fairly mild. And this is, uh, this is somewhat more restrictive. Um, uh, but the, the conclusion is that if it does indeed admit such, or so there's only one such metric um, which has this property. So um, that's a uniqueness among those which have found a Ricci curvature and whose vector fields satisfy this condition that if I apply the complex structure to them, it's one of these special holomorphic vector fields obtained from my action. Um, and if it does admit some, then it turns out um, this action can be complexified. And I will say in just one second what that means. Um, and that this thing is biholomorphic to my original space is biholomorphic to a quasi-projective toric variety. Um, so what do I mean when I say this thing can be complexified? It means that the, remember I'm starting off in this case with only an action of this real torus. Um, and that means there exists an action of this far bigger torus um, whose corresponding, you know, th that, that extends this action, right? So if I look at the underlying real torus action, 
of that thing. It's my original one. So if I start off with just this real torus section, I don't know a priori that I have this big open dense set, which looks just like C star to the end, but it turns out that you do, if you admit a uh, uh, Kelerici soliton, which is complete. Um, okay, so to summarize what I'm saying here, this is, um, uh, similar to the previous theorem, just instead of assuming a priori that I'm TN invariant, I only now assume this condition on the vector field, and I assume that the Ricci curvature is bounded. Um, but the conclusion is basically the same with this extra um, nice thing, which says that uh, this thing, which a priori didn't have as nice of a structure, turns out to. Okay, um, so... This business about complexification, if you're used to working on compact manifolds, it might seem silly. Um, the a TN action can always be complexified on a compact manifold, given the, my previous setups. Um, and the reason is essentially that all vector fields are complete, right? So if I have a TN action, I get this inclusion of the Lie algebra inside of the space of holomorphic vector fields, and then I can take J uh, of all those things and then flow out in that direction and, and try to get a C star uh, action from that. Um, and if, all, and if all of those vector fields turn out to be complete, then you can do that, right? So you can, you can obtain a C star action from each of those vector fields, put that all together to a C star to the N action. Um, but if your manifold is not compact, then it may well be, and we'll see an example in a second, that if I do that, uh, even if my original vector field is complete, if I take J, that may not be. Um, so I apologize for all the sirens on my street here. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, um, right, so that's like I just said, if M is not compact, this isn't true anymore. So like a, a, a nice example is this unit disk inside of C, right? So if I look at the S1 action on that, that certainly preserves the unit disk. Um, that's effective, the, no element of S1 does nothing and it's holomorphic. Um, but there's no way that I can, if I, if I was able to take J of that corresponding uh, rotational vector field, well, what I get is the Euler vector field and the C corresponding C star action just would, uh, would uh, give me a diffeomorphism between uh, the unit disk and C, which we know can't exist, right? So certainly this, this doesn't work in the non-compact setting in general. Um, so part of what the theorem says is that there's a, that you, you can fix that problem. Um, Right, so lastly, uh, here, um, you remember that we have these uh, solitons on uh, CN and on CPN um, when I choose the appropriate vector field here. Um, and the soliton equation uh, is, is really good about products. Um, if I have a one on this space, one on this space, and I take the product, I can just take the product metric. It'll also satisfy this equation um, with the product vector field. Um, um, and so what I'm going to just for in terms of names, I've already kind of uh, said this, I think, once uh, if I the product of the Fubini study metric on Euclidean space or sorry, on the on projective space and the Euclidean metric on Euclidean space, that product metric, I'm going to call the standard cylinder. Um, so it's maybe a bit silly to say that since none of them are actually um, the, the normal cylinder. But in any case, um, so the standard cylinder uh, on CP1 cross C. Uh, is the unique uh, shrinking gradient Kelerici soliton with bounded scalar curvature. Um, again, just up to these automorphisms. Um, so here, uh, I only assume bounded scalar curvature, and I don't need to make any assumptions on the, the vector field. So this is a corollary of this previous thing. And the proof basically says, you know, if I have such a thing, uh, then I can find in one automorphism which makes the vector field, whatever it happens to be, in this nice set of vector fields, right? So if you go back real quick, um, this condition that Jx is in the Lie algebra is gonna be the key thing there. Okay, so that's the, the last result that I wanna mention. Um, and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to sort of get into some of the key steps of how you prove things like this. Um, so uh, introduce a little bit more background to do that. Um, and so, so we're just in the setting of having a Kähler manifold now. So I'm, I'm suppressing the, the complex structure in this notation here. Um, and we're going to be assuming that there's an effective TN action, which preserves our original Kähler metric, right? So again, there's a complex structure that this preserves as well too. 
Um, so like I've mentioned, this is in particular a symplectic form and we're going to actually make use of its symplectic properties um, explicitly. Um, so the, the most important thing for us is going to be the notion of a moment map um, for the TN action. And remember, so I'm gonna try and highlight here uh, the difference between this real torus action and the complex torus action. So here I'm only considering having a real torus action on the Kähler manifold, possibly not compact. So when I say a moment map, what I'm referring to is um, smooth map. So it uh, takes you from your space into the dually algebra of your torus. Um, and it satisfies some equation. Um, I've got it here. Um, what does this mean? So here, this Lie algebra, like I said, is we identify that with vector fields on M. So that's what it means to take the interior product of uh, um, your Kähler form with something in the Lie algebra. Um, and this pairing here is just, just denoting the dual pairing between T, the Lie algebra, and its dual. So if you like, if you choose this natural metric on the Lie algebra, this is just the dot product on Rn, right? So that I, some, some equation like this. So, I mean, maybe that looks like nothing if you haven't seen this before, um, but if you've seen any basic symplectic geometry, you might know what a Hamiltonian function uh, for a vector field is. And what a, what a moment map is, is just a collection of Hamiltonian functions for all the possible vector fields that you'd be considering. All right, so it's kind of stitch it. You get one for each one, you stitch them all together in a nice way. Um, so we'll say that the action is Hamiltonian if we have such a thing, right? So with the, the way to think about this is I have a Kähler manifold, I have an action, that thing may or may not be Hamiltonian. If it is, that means there exists one of these moment maps. Okay. Um, and one of the features that um, that uh, should keep in mind in terms of thinking about the geometry of this thing is that essentially these are constant. On, you can make a choice such that these are constant on the TN orbits, right? So if I have this TN action on my manifold, I have a bunch of these orbits, um, the, the moment map doesn't change value here. So we'll think about this as a, as a sort of vibration. Okay, so we'll have to touch on a little bit of the algebraic geometry of this. I'll try to keep this to a bare minimum here. Um, so uh, even, I guess, uh, farther down, I'm gonna have to talk a little bit about combinatorics. Um, so part of the what I need to introduce here is uh, polytopes and polyhedra. So what does that mean? Um, just to make, I'm sure you guys have seen these things before, but in terms of the terminology, when I say polyhedron, that's gonna be anything which is a finite intersection of half spaces. Um, and a polytope is going to be, uh, inside of Rn, it's a finite intersection of half, half spaces, which happens to be bounded, right? So when I say polyhedron, you should imagine like something possibly extending off to infinity, but polytope is like a square. Yeah. So that's hopefully not too bad. Um, and then there's some sort of magic uh, algebraic geometry that you can do, which if you're given a suitably nice uh, polyhedron, um, you can cook up a quasi-projective toric variety. Um, well, the only thing I want to note about this process is that if I have a polyhedron inside of Rn, um, then the dimension of this uh, uh, variety you cook up is the complex dimension is also n. Um, uh, so I guess not the only thing I want to mention, I want to say this is, uh, uh, turns out to be always a toric manifold. Um, and the compactness of this thing is directly related to the compactness of the corresponding polyhedron. So if I start off with a non-compact polyhedron, so just a regular old polyhedron, then the thing that I'll produce is gonna be a non-compact uh, algebraic torque manifold. Um, and if the thing I start off with it is compact, then I end up with a compact one. So I don't wanna say anything about how this process works, just there's some sort of, you can wave your magic wand and it makes one for you. Um, so some key examples, uh, again, you'll see this over and over again. If I start off with, well, certainly just the half space inside of R consisting of all positive numbers, um, that's a polyhedron. And if I do this magic, I'll, I'll end up with um, C. And if I choose a closed interval inside of R, and I sort of wave my magic wand, what I'll get is CP1. Um, so I don't wanna say too much about that, just that there exists such a thing you could do. And there's a reason why we, we need to care about that. Um, so going back in time a little bit, um, 
the so in, in terms of what we want out of these moment maps, um, how does this relate to geometric analysis? Um, we'll see the kind of uh, there's a few steps, and then we'll see what what we end up getting. Um, so this classic result of Atiyah and simultaneously Geilman and Sternberg says, if I have a 2n real dimensional compact symplectic manifold with an effective and Hamiltonian Tn action, um, right, that means that there's a moment map, um, then the image of this moment map is always a polytope. Okay, so what that means is you can have this nice picture, I've got my manifold, I got my moment map maps down onto some nice on easily easy to understand subset of Euclidean space. And it's kind of, it's like a vibration over most of these points, you just have uh, TN orbits. So you'll see, we'll see, this will help us understand the geometry. Um, so the connection with complex geometry is that uh, in that same setting, if, um, if my manifold was cooked up by this magic algebraic procedure, then the polytope that you get is the image of the moment map is the same one that you started with. So if I start off, for example, with the open interval zero into infinity in R, the map the I'll, I'll get C. And if I have some, if I pick some TN invariant Kähler metric on this thing and I have a moment map, then the image of that moment map is gonna be that interval. I guess I should have chosen a compact example, but we'll see that with the suitable choices, that's gonna be true in the non-compact setting as well. So the, con the conclusion, like I said, is that you have a correspondence. This polytope gives you a correspondence between compact Hamiltonian manifolds with the TN action and compact complex manifolds with the C star to the N action. And what do you want to do with this? Well, what you would like to do, um, if you're interested in studying geometric analysis, um, is to understand equations better um, using this. So how can I do that? Um, well, essentially, this moment map lets you get some nice kind of coordinates on your manifold. So in, more precisely, um, if I look at the interior of this polytope, then it turns out that this moment map is actually a diffeomorphism. So remember, I told you there was a always, um, so how, how should I say? Um, there's a big open set where this is a, 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 gonna be a diffeomorphism. Uh, and between the interior of this polytope cross your torus uh, and this open set, right? So what it says is that even in the, just the purely uh, you know, non-complex symplectic setting, I can write my uh, toric manifold as a sort of compactification of uh, something, uh, something big, right? So this is a, something easy to understand. This is a product of some nice open subset of Euclidean space and this torus and moreover, if I have a TN invariant Kähler metric on this thing, then I have a nice explicit representation for what it is in, in these, in the coordinate, quote coordinates given by this product here. Um, so it turns out there's a sort of potential function, which I'm calling U. And this is just a function on the polytope, right? So this only, this doesn't depend on the to real torus. And that makes sense because I'm asking for the metric to be invariant under the torus, right? Um, and your metric can always be given in such a form um, so this is when I say uij here I'm referring to the the, the Hessian matrix with respect to the coordinates on on p um, and this is the inverse of that so the entire metric structure is just determined by one potential function um, again even in the uh, non-complex setting so that um, sometimes refer to this as a symplectic potential um, like it's similar to a Kähler potential. So why would you go through all this song and dance? Well, the, it turns out that when you do all of this, you can get a sort of massive simplification in a lot of cases. So the famous example of how this was used was to study scalar curvature. This was done originally by a bro uh, and then um, really, really made use of by Donaldson in 2002. Um, this was sort of a big inspiration for the a lot of this conversation around case stability. Um, that's going on now. Um, so you get this nice expression for the scalar curvature, which looks like, so I take the Hessian of, uh, of U and I take the inverse. Uh, and then I look at all the second partial derivatives of those terms and I take the trace of that thing. So maybe that sounds complicated, but it's a fourth order equation. So this is, uh, turns out fairly simple, um, relatively speaking. Um, uh, what we're gonna be more interested in is the the kähler ricci soliton equation, which turns out to look, uh, in my opinion, even nicer. Um, it's only a second order equation. Um, so what it turns out to be, so if, with what I, 
the, if you have, if this metric G happens to satisfy the Kehler Ricci soliton equation, then this potential function U satisfies this equation. So determinants of the, remember, this is just a real valued function. This is a real Hessian um, uh, is equal to, you know, this some term involving the first derivatives of U. Um, the only missing piece of information here is this constant, um, which is uniquely determined by the soliton vector field. And so the, the, the upshot is that to, I can study complex Mangin pair equations on my original manifold. The moment map lets me sort of push that down to just studying a real Mangin pair equation on, inside of on this domain in Rn for my potential function. And that's going to turn out to be a lot simpler to, to do in a lot of cases. So this is all in the compact setting. Um, and there's a lot more subtleties that arise in the non-compact case, I guess, as you might expect. Um, so first thing is that uh, if I just, if I state this in as big of a generality as I possibly could imagine, um, the image of a moment map on a, on a non-compact symplectic manifold doesn't even need to be convex. So certainly not gonna be a nice polytope always. Um, uh, and there's, there's even worse um, things that can happen. We'll see some of them in a minute. Um, but the real crux of how the previous thing worked is that how can we reduce to a Mangin pair equation to a, sorry, to a real Mangin pair equation, right? We, we, we needed to be able to work inside of Rn using the moment map. And to do that, to actually study sort of metrics, which are varying, uh, we need to make sure that that image is always the same of the moment map. So we can study all the possible metrics by just studying the one nice open subset of Rn. Um, so that's going to be the goal. And remember, this was achieved for us, but with Delzant's theorem, right? Delzant's theorem said, um, this is worth, uh, if I have any uh, on a compact manifold, uh, Hamiltonian TN action, then the image of the moment map is this one fixed thing, this one polytope, which, which I, which I gave, which uh, gave me my original manifold, right? Um, so if I'm working in the setting of uh, um, manifolds with the C star to the N action, then I always have a fixed image of the moment map given to me by Delzant's theorem. And so we need some analog of that in a non-compact case in order to make this picture work. Um, and so the, the, actually the first main step uh, in the proof of all of the theorems I mentioned at the beginning is to prove a, a Delzant type theorem um, for certain non-compact manifolds. Um, so for us, it's going to be if they admit a complete shrinking gradient Kehler Ricci soliton, then the conclusion is um, that the, you know what the image of the moment map is going to be a priori. So then I can study only things on that, um, it turns out, unbounded polyhedron. So that's the first step, is to see if you can reduce searching for uh, shrinking gradient Kehler Ricci solitons, which is a complex Mangin pair equation on the, on the manifold. See, it turns out you can reduce that to studying real Mangin, Mangin pair equations on the polyhedron inside of Rn. You have to identify what that is. And then once you do that, then there's a, a little bit more standard machinery that can kick in. Um, so you, then you need to prove a theorem uh, which establishes the uniqueness of those real Mangin pair equations itself, right? So I'd like to prove uniqueness for Kehler Ricci solitons. I reduce that using the moment map to studying a real Mangin pair equation inside of Rn, and then I prove a uniqueness theorem for the, those real Mangin pair equations. Um, and the way you do that is you study the Ding functional, and this is something that um, is kind of classic in Keller geometry now, um, but has a really nice uh, representation uh, in, in the toric picture. Um, so I mean, this is a bunch of stuff maybe hard to read all at once. I think the important thing to sort of recognize about it is that if I remember what my uh, Kehler Ricci soliton equation looked like, um, if I differentiate this thing, then you might imagine uh, sort of this part, um, or sorry, this part here coming from this term, and then the rest uh, coming from this term. And so it turns out that that intuition is correct, and that the critical points of this functional are uh, uh, solutions to this real Mangin pair equation. Okay, so in the remaining time, I would just want to sort of break down a little bit about um, how you prove the second part. Um, since I guess this is a geometric analysis seminar, I'll focus more on the analytic perspective. 
Um, so, um, so right, like I mentioned, there's always this dense orbit um, inside of M. So it's just a little bit uh, the the setup of how you like how do you do this in practice. Um, there's this dense orbit inside of your manifold. Um, uh, so we, we'll be working on that. And the nice thing is it's like a big coordinate chart. Um, and it's sufficiently big that we can kind of ignore everything else in a sense, right? So it's, it's open-ended dense. Um, so that's what I mean by when I say by continuity, it often suffices just to work exclusively on this open set. If you know that things extend properly, then you just basically have everything that you need. Um, so um, we'll be studying uh, invariant killer metrics, which uh, uh, which you can write as i del bar of a function on u. It turns out that's not a very restrictive uh, thing to ask for, um, right? So we're on c star to the n. Just imagine we're on c star to the n now, and we're looking at killer metrics, which are just i del bar of a potential function, um, which do exist since we're on c star to the n, right? Um, so we'll take these natural coordinates on c star to the n, and it's going to be super convenient to work in the logarithmic coordinates. So I'm going to call um, uh, C is going to always mean the real part of the log of Z and then theta is the, if you think of it as the translation version of so the universal cover of the real torus maybe. Um, okay, so this is still, you know, some big open set in here. Um, and so the condition that this uh, metric is TN invariant is equivalent, right? If it's I del, I del del bar of a function for this uh, potential killer potential function phi here to only depend on C, the real part of the, the, the log, right? That's just saying it only depends on the radius, not the what have you, rotating part. And so what that says, if I now go back and say, what does it mean that omega is I del del bar of this function? Then if I write this in sort of uh, these real coordinates in the, in the logarithmic, um, by the real coordinates corresponding to the logarithmic holomorphic coordinates, then my omega is uh, the, the Hessian with respect to C of phi in front of this uh, standard symplectic form, which says that that has to be a positive definite matrix, which in turn says that this function here is convex, right? So you can think if you, if you have studied any um, uh, like pluripotential theory, you're used to your, your killer metrics being related to I del del bar of pluri-subharmonic functions. Um, so we kind of, the TN invariant list to cut out some of the complex geometry there and the corresponding analog is just convex functions. Um, okay, um, so a little bit of the, what's the this link between this complex picture and the symplectic one I was describing earlier? Um, well, again, we're going to be working on this dense orbit here. Um, and we have that our omega is, I think it's useful to just see this here, our omega is basically given by the Hessian of this real function, real value function phi um, convex. And we had a moment map earlier, right? So suppose that we, we're in the, in the setting where it says Hamiltonian. So we have a moment map. Um, then it turns out if I'm working on, you know, on this side, um, so here I'm sort of working on C star to the N, um, then I can find what my moment map is explicitly. Um, it's just, if I look at the Euclidean gradient of this function phi, right? So just the, the, the vector valued function whose uh, components are the partial derivatives of phi with respect to C, so nothing to do with the metric. Um, um, then the, that, that's what turns out to be my moment map. And so if, I, if you roll back, um, if we're working in a setting where I know what the image of the moment map is a priori, that tells me that the gradient of phi is this uh, uh, is this one fixed? Uh, and if it's compact, it's a polytope. Um, so the the connection between um, the the complex and the symplectic geometry. This I mentioned the symplectic potential function earlier. Um, that was something which was defined on the image of the moment map, right? And this function phi is something which is defined on R n. Um, so the connection between these two things, these are determined actually one-to-one -one by each other, which you might expect since they both determine the metric. Um, it's this thing called the Legendre transform, which is something you can do to convex functions. Um, and it's given like this. So this U turns out to be the unique function which satisfies an equation of this form. Um, so this is 
perhaps a bit strange if you haven't seen it before, but in any case, there is some way to determine the one from the other in a more natural setting. Okay, so I think I may skip a bit talking about uniqueness of the vector field just in terms of time. We might be able to come back to this at the end if there are questions. Um, instead, I will mention just uniqueness of the equation. So the first step would be to prove that the vector field is unique. Um, so there's only one vector field, um, which could be the vector field of a shrinking gradient Kelly-Ricci soliton, uh, you know, in such a way that it works in this uh, toric setting. So then that basically just fixes what these constants in the real Malgen pair equation can be. And remember step one of the sketch was to fix the domain that these functions u depend on. So first we fix the domain, then we fix these constants c. So the equation is determined. And now we, once for the fixed equation, we need a uniqueness theorem for that. And so for this is where the Ding functional comes in. And the real issue here, I mean, the real thing that needs to be worked out is what is the right space of fun convex functions on this thing once you're at this stage to, to be working on? Um, the rest is kind of um, something which has been done before. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the critical points of this functional are solutions to the real Malgen pair equation. Um, and so the, the theorem is it, that this is a strictly convex function. Um, if I have a function u, which is coming from a shrinking gradient killer Ricci soliton on some toric manifold, um, then it is the unique critical point, right? So it's strictly convex, it has a unique critical point. Um, and the, the, the symplectic potential corresponding to my original problem that I care about is, is the unique such thing, if it exists. Um, so how do you do that? Then my probably last slide I'll say here. Um, well, the, like the, the, the key is the moment map, like I mentioned. Um, and so you reduce this to a, a couple of elementary facts about convex functions. Um, so basically we'll consider the, the, if I'm, suppose I'm given two such things, I, this is a notation, I'll let u sub t be that convex combination there. Um, and then remember, I told you there was this thing called the Legendre transform, which lets you take any, uh, any one thing and on, so uh, there's this, there's a, it's a duality. So if I have a function on the, a convex function on the polytope, I can produce something on Rn using that and vice versa. So if I have something on Rn, I can produce something on the polytope. If you make the right assumptions. So I'll let phi sub t be that, that process applied to this path. Um, and then there's this kind of, uh, old school uh, sort of, uh, I don't even know what to call this. It's a, well, it's an inequality. Um, I, I think it was first observed by Berman and Bernson. This would be really useful um, in this setting um, because what it turns out to mean is, um, let me just skip to that here. Uh, it turns out to mean pretty much directly from this that you get this uh, convexity. Um, uh, of the Ding functional from this. So the, the way that you do that is by observing that if I think about the Legendre transform hard enough, then this term here, which appears in this Recopa inequality is exactly this term here, which appears in the Ding functional. Um, so you kind of have this kind of classical result, which tells you automatically, if you can nail down the space of functions well enough, then you'll get convexity for free. So that's kind of what I was mentioning about how the real trick is figuring out the space of convex functions well enough. Um, so I think because just because of time, I'll stop here. Um, so thanks again. Um, thank you, thank you. V virtual applause all around. Are there any questions in the audience? So, so I, I, I have a novice one. So I'm, uh, I'm not uh, really familiar with this non-compact complete world, but I have to ask. So in this direction, you, you mentioned that there, there's already some uniqueness results about solitons when there's some specific fall off conditions at infinity. Mm -hmm. Then you obtain some assuming this kind of global symmetry mm -hmm. either on the manifold or on your metrics or a combination. Mm -hmm. so, 
is there sort of an overarching uh, conjecture uh, that is, you know, supposedly going to contain uh, many or all of the results of this type in, in, in this area? Aha, uh -huh. yeah, um, that's a good question. So I think there are some such things floating around. Um, I think that um, at least, so what I know mostly about, so I think that there's kind of uh, two, they're not separate worlds, but they're, they're kind of two worlds here. And one of them is the, the, the Kaler world. And then there's a sort of more general uh, sort of shrinking solitons world in, in the Ramanian. So I personally would be specific more, more to the Kaler uh, uh -huh. situation. So I think in, in the Kaler way. setting, I think that uh, we mostly think these things are unique. Um, so, so essentially what you say is complete, non-compact, plus Kaler, plus sh shrinking soliton? Shrinking specifically, yeah. yeah. Could imply there's only one. Yeah, that's. I think the, the the basic idea I think is is that, but it doesn't seem so easy to get your hands on that. I mean, the that's it's so far hard without at least a curvature condition. Um, but the the reach. So the the, the curvature condition that uh, that I use comes from this work of Colin Durwell and Son, and they. Um, they need, uh, it's kind of related to this completeness of vector fields issue. Um, it, so that they use the boundary reach curvature there, but there's kind of some indications that it shouldn't be necessary, but kind of no idea how to remove it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's that. Uh, so like, for example, how do I prove this one about uh, CP1 times C? So the statement there was um, that, um, there's only one with bounded scalar curvature. So now no assumptions on anything except uh, bounded scalar curvature. Um, uh, you know, this already kind of takes a lot of work. Um, I basically have to um, show that I, you can cook up an automorphism of CP1 times C that takes your uh, uh, soliton that you have and makes it uh, t invariant under the, the natural T2 action. Um, so I think in terms of achieving that, it's not it's not so clear, um, but I do think that's the 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 thought. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Did any other questions arise? <clears throat> yes, uh, actually about this theorem. If you uh, take this uh, topological bundle of CP one, mm -hmm. can you say anything? Is that possible? Yeah, it, it might be um, the. But, but I don't know, right? So I, I thought about a few possible uh, extensions of this, but it, it turns out to actually be quite a bit of work even just to get this from what I already um, mentioned. Um, so like the, 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 way that, the way that I do this, um, and, and there might be a better way, this is just the only way I knew, was um, to like, um, I mean, it involved like a, Basically, doing some Morse theory using the the, some, the what do you call this thing soliton potential. Um, so you kind of you know some facts about what the shrinking gradient Kelly-Ricci solitons that potential function f um, turns out to be a kind of almost a Morse function. And so you got to understand some things about the critic like the critical set of that uh, of that Morse function. Um, and so basically, I need to nail down where the fixed points of the action are which can be kind of a priori uh, crazy. Um, so I think in this case, I use, there's some parts of it that kind of are a bit special, I think for two complex dimensions, um, but it doesn't seem like those are really necessary. I just happen to need to use them for my argument. So I thought a little bit about it, but it's not super clear to me how it would go just yet. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, so if not, then we'll thank Charlie once once more. Uh, accept our apologies on behalf